Hello, my name is Karen. I'm the library assistant in the Special Collections Center at the Davenport Public Library, Maine. And this is our latest episode of Opening the Box. We're going to see what we can find regarding the Newcomb Loom Company. There are actually two accessions that are in our archive and manuscript collection regarding this company. And so we're gonna explore a little bit in both of them. Charles Nelson Newcomb, who was part of the firm Allen and Newcomb, left Tipton, Iowa to come to Davenport around 1889, 1890, in order to um, broaden the manufacturing and marketing of the popular rag carpet loom that they had been working with. Mr. Newcomb got the patent for that in November of 19, excuse me, November of 1887. And um, as you can see in this advertisement that was in the Davenport City Directory in 1890, um, it was for making rag carpets, rugs, silk window curtains, and so forth. The Morning Democrat had this advertisement in 1891 about um, Mr. Newcomb buying out his partner, Mr. Allen. And so it says that um, they came a little more than a year ago from Tipton and um, they've doubled their output several times. And Mr. Newcomb recently purchased the entire interest of his partner and has 25 men employed in the factory besides several agents. And he's turning out a number of complete looms each day. And it says, um, Mr. Newcomb, a practical weaver, has made a remarkable success of his invention and well deserves it. Such men make a city. Um, Mr. Newcomb actually had patents on a number of different looms. One was called the Little Daisy the rug loom that we just saw pictured in the city directory and one called the weaver's friend. And as we said before in the last slide that they were used to weave rugs and carpets, curtains and more from rags which were torn into long strips. And this was their factory. This is a drawing that appeared in the Sanger Fest in 1898. In 1899, uh, New Newcomb began producing the Weaver's Delight, and that particular loom became the number one most popular of all the looms that the company would sell. And this is the patent for that loom. And as you can see down in the lower right corner, the inventor is C.N. Newcomb. From 1900, 1901, there were lots of changes for Mr. Newcomb. He had continued to acquire all these patents, but the railroad, the Chicago Rock Island Pacific Railroad uh, forced him to relocate his business that was on Fifth Street because that's where they wanted the rail line to go. So he considered um, leaving Davenport and moving his business across the river. But finally, a lawyer attorney um, convinced him to um, instead sell the business to a newly formed stock company. So for $20,000, Newcomb agreed to um, stay active with the firm for about 90 days so that he could help them smoothly transition. The new president and treasurer was Charles Paskey or PASH, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. The vice president was Dr. A. L. Hagebeck. Secretary and manager was Mr. Sears and um, Henry True and Mr. Flick were the remaining members of the board of directors. 
In the deal, Newcomb retained the royalties, stock, and ownership of the building, which they moved into, uh, which was on West 2nd Street in Davenport. So they convinced him to stay in town. This is a picture of his residence in 1898. Newcomb had a wife, Martha, and several children. They made their home at 625 Warren in this home, um, but they soon were drawn to the warmer climate of Florida. And Charles Newcomb became a big developer and property owner in a little place called Riviera, which is near West Palm Beach. It's a little bit north of Miami. He bought a hotel there and completely renovated it and turned that into their residence. And then he continued um, developing the greater part of Riviera, Florida. And he lived there uh, for a number of years and passed away in 1935 at the age of 85 years. I think he did very well from the royalties on all of his patents. About a year after the stock company per made the purchase, the president resigned uh, to leave. He went to a, a different company here in town. Dr. Hagebeck was elected president. Carl Schlegel became vice president and W.B. Stark became the secretary and treasurer. And as you can see from, this is a 1911, a couple of pages from the 1911 catalog, the Weaver's Delight continues to be a very popular loom. Um, the price, as you can see in the upper right, uh, the price of a complete outfit, $125. Um, get acquainted with your Weaver's Delight always ready to help you weave the dollars. And the one on the right that young ladies could make 25 to $50 a week and have their time all to themselves. In 1912, they were ready for bigger accommodations. So a new building was erected at the plant site on West 2nd Street, making a nice two-story addition to the factory. And according to the newspaper at that time, quote, the business has grown by leaps and bounds. By 1914, a gentleman named Frank Neerham, who's pictured here, was made president and W.B. Stark was still the secretary. And the corporation increased its capital stock from $35,000 to $75,000. Five years later, Stark sold his interests to Frank Neerham, and he became the owner and operator of Newcomb Loom. Attention to detail and customer satisfaction were high priorities for Mr. Neerham. They offered many services to their customers. The company would even send somebody out to help assemble and uh, assist in setting up a weaving business if the customer wanted. And their range of equipment for sale continued to grow. The price list on the left shows some of the different um, items that they would sell. They All these different tools that could make the process e easier, um, allow for different sizes of rugs. Um, replacement parts. And on the far right, you can see um, some of the accessories that, like a shuttle, pattern books, and so forth. Newcomb Loom even offered a registry for their looms, particularly for people who bought used looms. They were encouraged to register with the company and they would receive free assembly and instruction booklets. And this is something that we often have requests for here in special collections. Someone purchases a loom at a sale, but they don't know how to assemble it. There are no directions with the loom itself anymore. They've been lost or misplaced over time. So um, this is something that we often have um, helped people out with using this collection. Um, 
these uh, pieces of paper were done, the earliest date on them is from the 1950s that I can see, and it goes into the 80s when the company folded. But um, I would imagine that this would be something very similar to what Mr. Neerum used during his tenure as the owner. The instruction packets looked something like this, obviously instructions stamped on there. And so the customer might receive some popular patterns for different rugs, how to weave the dog tracks, the queen's delight, the monk's belt, the diamond with the stripe, and one called honeysuckle. There were lots of different patterns. We had these all over our house. I remember my mom and grandma had them everywhere. Here are a couple more detailed instructions, how to set your loom up, how to, um, how many spools you needed, how many, you know, 12 white, 12 black, what, whatever colors you needed to get a certain size of a rug, um, using a certain size of a warp and reed and so forth. I don't know what all the terms mean myself. Preparation of carpet rags. This is something I remember as a little young person. Um, I remember my mother and my grandmother tearing the strips of cloth. And I remember my grandmother sewing the strips together. And then my job was to roll the strips into a ball. And I still have a couple of the balls that, that I wove and I put them out in bowls every once in a while or just to kind of take a trip down memory lane. But it says here, it, it gives you um, suggestions on how wide you should uh, cut or tear your fabrics, the different types of fabrics that are, are appropriate and the kinds that would not be appropriate. And certainly they're saying this is a thrifty practice. Um, I love the, the ladies up in the top right corner. What a beautiful rag rug and pleasant surroundings enhance the joy of living. And again, the, the idea of it's thrifty, this is something that can save you money. You can make money if you sell them. Always very popular. Becoming more popular every day, suitable for any room in the home, large or small, mansion or cottage. Dainty, durable, washable, desirable. This is another type of loom that they manufactured, the Studio Four Harness Art Loom. And um, you can see the different threads that are stacked up there. And it's, it's quite an interesting process. I've seen people use looms. I've never actually done it myself. And they give you advice on what to do with broken threads, floating threads. And here's another view of the four harness art loom, the studio. Here's some, uh, another, um, this is the dog track rug that we saw the the pattern for earlier. Um, they, they're very clear in their directions. Um, they talk about if you use fuzzy material, you're going to get a fuzzy rug. If you use smooth material, you're going to get a smooth rug. How you want it to all be something of the same weight and type. Um, they give you advice on where to cut your warp so that you get enough for fringe. Um, it's quite quite a process, but they, they explain things very clearly. The silk curtains and um, porch pillow covers. This is the one I love. Porch pillow covers should be woven in bright colors. High school or college colors may be used to good advantage. That Virginian is a pretty pattern. I wouldn't mind having that in my house. Here's a, another um, look at prices as time went on. 
obviously you can tell that from the font and the style that that this is later on in but um the weaver's delight at this time remember that earlier advertisement the weaver's delight was uh 125 dollars now they're up to 490 dollars um the studio art loom depending on how wide it is the price varies a little bit and the improved number three, which I believe is that earliest model that he made, that's $480. This is a piece of their stationery. Um, you can see that they've got the image of the rug kind of in the background. And then the back side has these two testimonials and pictures. Um, one is from a woman in South Dakota and one from a woman in Ohio. And they talk about how they are so happy that they got the loom. It's easy to learn to weave if you follow the directions. My daughter and I keep busy and folks want to know where they can buy a good loom like ours. I always say Newcomb Loom Company makes the best there is. And the woman from Ohio says they can weave 15 yards most days and do a 30, I can't read if it says 34 or 54 inch, I think it says 54 inch rug in 15 minutes. So once you get it all set up, it wouldn't take that long to actually do the weaving apparently. This is another a newer image then of the Weaver's Delight from a couple different angles, just a newer catalog. And again, instructions for unpacking, assembling and operating. That's what we get you asked for the most, um, how to hang the things and how to get the everything put together and properly. Um, how, I, the practical, simple, economical method of taking finished rugs out of the loom. Apparently you could weave a rug and then you'd leave some of the warp or the threads, um, maybe a, a foot or so, and then weave another rug. And then you could let them roll up on the beam apparently. And then you could um, remove them and just cut cut, cut, and you'd end up with all your rugs. It wasn't like you had to weave one, take it off, weave one, take it off. Here's some, just another pattern, that Anderson rug. Looks like kind of a basic one. But again, shows you all the different, the ways to uh, line up your colors so that you get that pattern. There's the honeycomb. This was a newsletter that we found in the collection, Weaving Wisdom by Betty. And um, the retired custodian at the top is from Wisconsin. He recently retired and was looking for a hobby and picked up weaving and he's well pleased with his loom. And uh, Miss Maud Folsom from an Iowa town says, my mother, sister, and I started weaving as a hobby, which has grown into a business. Last year, we made over 350 rugs. We enjoy weaving. There's just another one of their envelopes that they would have sent to a customer. Another different booklet, another testimonial from a lady in Oklahoma talking about how thrilled she is with her weaver's delight. Mr. Nearman passed away in 1954 at age 88. And this editorial appeared in the Daily Times newspaper in addition to his obituary. Frank Neerum, who died Sunday at 88 years old, had been engaged in the manufacture of looms since the early 1900s. He came to Davenport with the Newcomb Loom Company in 1907 and purchased control of it 
in 1919. In the years which followed, his looms made their appearance wherever hand weaving was in demand and customers were found abroad as well as in the United States. Today, there are only two or three companies in the United States besides the Newcomb firm, which is to continue that manufacture hand looms exclusively. Last year, folks in about 15 foreign countries, including Israel, purchased looms made in Davenport. About 90% of the hand looms built in this country today are bought by individuals who want to augment family income with spare time work at home. Looms also are popular in institutions for the blind and for occupational therapy in hospitals. Mr. Neerman, Neerum loved his work. When able, he arrived at his shop early in the morning and didn't care when he left. In business, he made it a rule never to deviate from a price policy maintained without discrimination. A loom cost so much, regardless of who was purchasing it. Yet there were many instances when Mr. Neerum saw to it that the handicapped and the underprivileged got looms and instruction in their operation. He gave the Friendly House its first loom, and as a trustee of that institution, served it in many other ways. Mr. Neerum's life and work proved that the warp and woof of fundamental values remain constant despite the rapid passage of years. About a year later, this article appeared in the Davenport Democrat Times. Mr. Neerum's son, Lyman, had taken over the business. And um, there's that phrase again, woof and warp, two distant lands. And there's a picture of one of the employees, a lady named Mrs. Betty McDermott, working on one of the looms. The business acumen of Frank Neerum had led the company to peak profits in 1955. Unfortunately though, with the exception of a, a brief revival in the 60s, the demand for large looms faded. And by the early 1980s, high costs and low profits led to the closing of the company. And they held an auction in October of 1982. As part of their closing, the company wrote a letter to each customer thanking them for their business. Superior customer service. Indeed, Mr. Neerum. Well done. That wraps it up for our opening the box today for Newcomb Loom. For any further information on these or other items in our collections, you can go to the website uh, archives.davenportlibrary.com and explore our archives and manuscript collection through um, archive space. That's it for today. Thanks very much for joining us. See you next time on Opening the Box.